All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in on a Thursday night. I'm so stoked to have you here. Welcome to Exhibit, the first out of four events that Digital Rights Watch is holding as part of our research projects looking at how to rebalance. All right. Hi, thing. everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in on a Thursday night. I'm so stoked to have you here. I just did exactly what I told all of the other speakers not to do. So um, it's looking good for this event. All right. So my name's Sam um, and I'm the program lead for Digital Rights Watch. Before we get going, I want to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands that we're tuning in from tonight. So I'm coming at you from the land of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Eastern Kulin Nation. But I know that we're coming from all over Australia. So if you could pop in the chat the country that you're coming in from, I think that'd be a really nice way to acknowledge the lands that we're tuning in from. So I want to acknowledge that the sovereignty of this land was never ceded and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people in the audience today. Thanks for coming. So many of the systems of content moderation, censorship and control that we'll be discussing today have roots in models of policing, which are of course intricately tied up in colonization. So I want to highlight that Indigenous communities have built rich systems of government governance and knowledge sharing over thousands of years. And there's so much to be learned from Indigenous ways of thinking when we're imagining a future in which the internet works for everyone. We all have a role to play in understanding, questioning and decolonizing these systems. So a bit of housekeeping, as you can see, we're not in Zoom at the moment, which is really exciting. Um, welcome to Venulus, um, happy to have you. So if you can see on the left, left-hand side, there are a few options there. Uh, you can have a look at the welcome page and also the bulletin board where we have a few links to different resources and things that I'd love for you to, to check out as we're going tonight. Feel free to use the chat and also to use the little reactions if you like what you're hearing. Um, or if I make a mistake, you can react <laughs> like at the beginning. Um, and we also have a couple of Digital Rights Watch moderators behind the scenes who are helping out tonight to make sure that everything runs smoothly. Uh, you know, we're not expecting to have any dickheads here tonight, but given the nature of the conversation we're about to have, they'll be there to just keep an eye on the chat to make sure that we don't get anything that's particularly uh, offensive or harassment or anything like that. So, you know, I am, the, the irony is not lost on me to be talking about content moderation tonight and to be warning you to, to keep it chill in the chat. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, we won't hesitate to kick people out if people are being um, awful. So please don't. Uh, you can also message Lucy directly. Um, she'll make herself known in the chat for you. So you can you can message her directly if you see anything that is um, you know warrants attention or if you're feeling if you're being made to feel uncomfortable in any way. Okay, so that's the housekeeping done. So moving on to this project that tonight is part of. So as I mentioned, it's all about rebalancing the internet economy. So we at Digital Rights Watch believe that the internet and digital platforms can and should work with the needs of local people and communities. And so this project is all about creating this grassroots narrative to guide the way that internet spaces are governed in Australia. The tech industry has attracted loads of criticism for failing to take concerns seriously, and government responses are often heavy handed and misdirected. And while it's relatively easy to sit back and criticize everything that's going on, we really wanted to do more than that. And so we're gathering members of various communities and representatives from digital platforms to try to think creatively and imagine a future where the internet works for all of us. So there are four events in the series, which are all geared, geared towards different uh, segments of creatives, content creators, and communities who use the internet. The themes are imagine, gather, create, and of course, exhibit, which is what we're doing tonight. A big shout out to the Internet Society Foundation, uh, who has given us the resources to be able to run this project as well. So the upcoming events, a little sneak peek. Uh, so Imagine will be all about writers, bloggers and the media. We'll be looking at copyright and intellectual property and how the Internet is changing the way that we consume ideas and writing. Create is all about musicians. So we'll be grappling with uh, payment models and streaming services and the online grind that it takes to be a, a musician on the internet in 2021. And then Gather is all about activists and organizers and community groups. We'll be looking at the tools that we use to coordinate and to communicate online for social progress. Obviously, in COVID times, being able to organize online is more and more important. 
and tonight, exhibit. It's what we're all here for tonight. We're gonna to be talking about what we can and what we can't see online. So content moderation, censorship, and how this impacts some of the most marginalized in our society. We're also doing additional research into community experiences and perspectives via a survey. So you can find the link in the bulletin board and we'd love for you to fill that out. Not now, pay attention to what we're about to say, but later on, if you could fill out that survey, that'd be amazing. If you use the internet to work, create, promote, anything at all, we really wanna hear from you. And this will help us to create that grassroots narrative. And if you could share it far and wide, it will be open for several months as we go through the rest of this project. And by the end, we're hoping to have some really community informed policy recommendations to be able to, to give to technology companies and to governments as well. All right, so let's get cracking. So content moderation and censorship are huge issues. Trying to decide what we can and can't see online is, is a really big problem. We've all seen the damage that can be caused by hate speech and misinformation and online harassment. And I'm sure many of us also know the frustration of seeing the content of a sex worker or an activist getting taken down, while it looks like far right content just kind of runs rampant. Online censorship can and does have really real life impacts upon people and can cause real world harms. Many people rely on digital platforms to be able to make a livelihood. So being deplatformed or shadow banned can cause very, very real harm. So it's clear that we need really meaningful policy in this space, but we really need to get the, the balance right. As it currently stands, we have policy and regulation that protects morals rather than people, but we think that we need it to, to be the other way around. So without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker who will be joining me to begin with, Zara Stardust. If we can get Zara onto the stage. Hi, Zara. Hi. So, so Zara is a socio-legal scholar working at the intersections of sexuality, technology, and law. She's a former penthouse pet, hustler honey, feminist porn awards heartthrob, and award-winning striptease artist. Zara is currently a postdoctoral research fellow with the ARC Center of Excellence for Automated Decision Making and Society at QUT, which is a mouthful to say. <laughs> um, and she has a book coming up soon called Indie Porn, which explores the regulation of queer and feminist pornographies through criminal laws, classification codes, and platform governance. So obviously, Zara, you are an, an excellent person to talk to when it comes to these issues. Um, you have loads of experience uh, research in this space, but also um, lived experience in this space. So we wanted to have you first to have this kind of fireside chat to get things going and really set the scene. And then we'll bring the other speakers in afterwards. Uh, I also wanted to highlight that you know, several, several writers and organizations have pointed out that sex workers are often some of the first to experience really like full on censorship online. They act kind of like a, a canary in the coal mine who suffer under uh, these restrictions before they're more broadly realized by the general public. So I think listening to and learning from sex worker experiences is really essential as we endeavor to make digital platforms a better place for everyone. So in a recent piece, you wrote that algorithms are notoriously poor at understanding sex in context. Algorithmic bias and regulatory overreach disproportionately affect sex workers, even where the activities are lawful. Let's kick it off. What, what do you mean by that? Can you give us a bit of an understanding of that sentiment? Yes, of course. And first, I just want to say thank you so much for having me, Sam. Um, I'm joining tonight from the stolen and unceded land of the Turrbal and the Yugra people in Mianjin. Um, and I want to pay respect to elders past, present and emerging and just recognise that those of us who are settlers here are continuing to benefit from the, benefit from the ongoing impacts of colonisation. It's not new that algorithms are notoriously poor at understanding context. Machine learning generally struggles with context. And when algorithms are designed to detect sex, they're often programmed simply to detect explicit words. And actually a really great example is the fact that the, this event tonight was blocked on Twitter for violating the ads policy 
presumably because it contains the word sex, or even though this is a public event that we're speaking about censorship and regulation. Um, but also last year when I was working at Scarlet Alliance, um, one of our tweets was blocked because it had the word whore in it, even though it was promoting an event that was called Whore Stories, which was a night of sex worker storytelling. There's many more examples of the ways in which algorithms screening for sex don't understand context um, and therefore have very broad overcapture, even when people are adhering to the terms of use um, or the community standards. And in fact, there's a great piece of research um, from the University of Sao Paulo and Stanford Law School where they examined an AI technology uh, called Perspective, where they found that tweets by drag queens on Twitter rated higher for toxic speech than tweets by white nationalists. So the sentiment analysis tools like this often read explicit words as inherently toxic and don't sufficiently understand the ways in which language may convey very different meanings, especially for LGBTQ people. But it's also not just about speech. We know that nudity classifiers are particularly problematic um, in recognising body parts, skin tones. They're often based on very unrepresentative training data and facial recognition technology has very high rates of error when purporting to recognise age and gender of people. It's also been proved to have significant racial bias, particularly high error rates um, when used amongst women of colour. And classifiers that attempt to recognise the gender of people's nipples or voice recognition software that attempts to recognise the gender of people's voices is always going to fail simply because not all nipples and voices are gendered or they're gendered in a way that is incoherent and unintelligible to the cis-normative assumptions and configurations of machine classifiers. So these technologies have inherent biases against trans and gender diverse people. There's also a facial recognition technology now that purports to recognise people's sexual orientation based on uh, grooming and facial features. But of course, sexual orientation is not necessarily biological or static. And so the algorithms are fundamentally flawed because they always presume that sex, gender or sexuality is something that is fixed or biologically determined or can be um, recognised and classified. Because so many platforms now prohibit sexuality and nudity as well as sexual solicitation, if we take uh, Facebook as the big bad example, they pick up a range of different users um, simply from people who are seeking to hook up uh, to sex educators and sex workers. And there's increasing evidence now about how this impacts people in terms of uh, their community development work, uh, their sexual health and HIV prevention work, access to abortion and family planning, as well as other harm reduction services. But for sex workers, it, the risk of detection uh, can bring very serious consequences. More and more people are moving to online work in the pandemic. Sex workers repeatedly report being shadow banned, suspended, deplatformed. And there's an amazing sex worker collective called Hacking Hustling um, over in New York who recently produced a report called Posting Into the Void. Uh, and they found that 30% of sex workers and 51% of sex workers who are also activists and organisers and protesters reported being shadow banned on social media. And they reported that the surveillance technologies had interrupted their ability first to earn an income, but also to do movement organising. And it's partly a problem of law. The Foster um, Fight Online uh, uh, Sex Trafficking Act in the United States does require internet intermediaries to avoid facilitating or promoting prostitution on their platforms, which has provided a legal incentive for platforms to simply, simply preemptively take down all sexual content. But it's also a problem of policy because many social media platforms had very restrictive and discriminatory policies uh, long before Foster. And one of the problems at the moment is that tech car companies and governments think that there are simple tech solutions to ensure safety online, that we can just get algorithms to work more effectively or become more accurate. But in reality, it's a broken policy framework. And the problems lie very much in how the community standards and the terms of service are iterated and then how the software is being designed and how it is being deployed. Mm -hmm. So the bottom line is we don't need to be screening for sex at all because sex should be able to be integrated onto platforms just like other forms of cultural media. Yeah, wow, what a what an amazing 
introduction, there are a few things in that that I think are really interesting. First of all, I definitely understand that sentiment of people being like, oh, it's fine, we'll just, we'll just get, make sure the tech is better. The, the tech will like solve this problem. But part of the problem I think of that is, is like, well, that would also require increased surveillance. And that's an outcome that we don't want to see either. The other thing that came to mind while listening to you talk just then was that there, there's kind of, there's a couple of, there's a couple of forms of harm happening here. There's like an individualized and a community level harm where people are losing income and losing their livelihoods and losing access to communities. But then there's also like this societal level harm where it's kind of like having this normative impact on what is and isn't okay, okay, you know, appropriate. Um, and, you know, also the ways that that can potentially impact political discourse and political outcomes as well. So it's, it's I mean, it's a huge area. So this hasn't come out of out of nowhere. Uh, I think it would be really good to get a little sense of some of the history of censorship, just like the cliff notes. Um, can you give us any like key sort of historical context that we should be considering in this conversation? Yeah, actually, it's quite fascinating when you look at the current approaches to content moderation, because we can see how they replicate all of these old approaches to censorship or obscenity or classification. And I think it's always used to go useful to go back to the origins of our modern use of the term pornography, because pornography was really revived as a term following the invention of the printing press in the 15th century, which, like the internet, brought this possibility of sexual material or iconoclastic material or irreverent materials enjoying very wide circulation and distribution among the masses and so uh, attempts to regulate pornography were a response to this kind of threat of democratization and it was only with the archaeological extraction of certain erotic artifacts that the term pornography acquired this this modern meaning and came to signify this like conceptual classification for erotic materials which were literally to be sequestered into a separate archive like away from other content and I think we can see that as the beginning of what is now an x18 plus category um, or an offline version of what we now think about as digital gentrification uh, that porn is something that is different to other forms of art or literature or daily artifacts and I think um that's worth noting that, the, that this separation is a relatively new phenomenon and shouldn't just be a default position. But the, yeah, um, in, I was just going to say, isn't the history like erotica once was like ideas and <laughs> philosophy and things as well? Is that is that right? I think that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And particularly when they were um, uh, extracting the um, archaeological, doing the archaeological digs, a lot of the material from Pompeii and Herculaneum were frescoes that had been outdoors and in public and in sex was integrated into daily life in a way that it is not uh, under kind of current frameworks. And so um, we, but we also see like during that time then in, in the, from the 19th century with the emergence of photography and photography came, became this thing that was a threat to the status of art. And so nude paintings were seen as something that left room for the imagination, but photography and by extension pornography was something that was too real, too graphic. Mm -hmm. And and now we see the same with Tumblr. Uh, with like Tumblr banned adult content in 2018, but they, and they prohibited a number of different kind of real life genitals and gifts and photos but they still uh, allow artistic nudity like literature or sculptures and so platform community standards are still based on these false distinctions whereby porn functions as a pejorative term to preserve the status of art yet we all know that art can be pornographic and porn can be incredibly artistic um, but yeah, to, to get back to your, I guess, your earlier question about the kind of the frameworks, like pornography offences were, were originally brought under obscenity frameworks um, in the UK during the 1800s. And the test was then like whether it had the potential to deprave or influence or corrupt audiences. And then it kind of moved, you can see it moving across different Western democracies, including to the United States, um, where they banned a whole lot of information about family planning and abortion and contraception at the same time. And then pornography was redefined in the 70s as something that appeals to the prurient interest or something that lacks serious artistic, literary mm -hmm. or scientific value. So it's seen as something that has, it's just empty, it's valueless, it's irredeemable. 
And then in the early case law in Australia and in Canada, they used the language of dirt, like it was described in some of the Canadian cases as dirt for dirt's sake. Canada later moved towards a framework of harm um, where like there was seen as a legitimate limit to the freedom of expression where pornography was considered harmful. But we see those same conversations playing out now in Australia with the Online Safety Act and also in the UK with the Online Harm Bill. Um, so it's important to keep kind of interrogating how those narratives of harm and safety are politicised. Even in yeah. Australia... Um, our classification law was supposed to supersede the censorship framework, but actually, um, and, and move to this test of community standards, assessing like what kind of content is offensive to the reasonable person. But it still retains a whole lot of language around morality, decency, propriety, that is really about middle class sensibilities around manners. And, and even in the original test, they, they distinguish what they thought of as ordinary, decent minded people and then people who peddle obscenities. So there's a very rigorous debates now about how community standards ought to be considered. Who is, is the reasonable person kinky? Um, you know, uh, should we be basing community standards on geographical standards or what about virtual standards? And when you look at our classification law as well, like even our X category, it, it precludes a range of different um, kinky sexual practices. There's a whole list that includes spanking, candle wax, bondage, piercing, golden flowers, fisting on the basis that they are um, offensive to a reasonable adult. So I think when we're assessing the current approaches to content moderation, it, it's good to look back because the, the platforms now um, use a range of all of these different kind of criteria very loosely based, but then sometimes they have no legal basis at all. And sometimes they're just simply based on the tastes of a particular CEO uh, or on perceived market or reputational risk. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think you raise a good point as well about that idea of like what is what is offensive and what isn't and that and that that um that line and i think we'll get into this a bit more with the panel about how this disproportionately impacts particular groups but something that immediately comes to mind for me is i read this great article a while ago by an australian i think he's i think their name is ryan thornycroft and they were talking about how um about how fisting is seen to be more um <laughs> Who knew we were going to talk about fisting tonight? Welcome. Uh, that fisting is more <laughs> pornographic than um, other other sexual acts, but how that can have impacts when it comes to um, people with various disabilities and things like that, and how so how the flow-on effect of those kinds of ideas. Um, but you made a great segue, I think, into the Online Safety Act, which I'd love to ask you about next, because I think that you're absolutely right. There are lots of there's lots of stuff in the Online Safety Act that is really grounded in this moralistic idea of what would or would not be offensive to a reasonable person. So I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about um, the Online Safety Act, um, your concerns with the approach. Uh, go for it. Yeah, of course. Um, well, the Online Safety Act received royal assent this month. Um, it's an attempt to address unprecedented platform power of big tech, um, but it does take a very selective approach to how it does that. There's several new initiatives um, from cyberbullying protections, but also to um, the removal of non-consensual intimate imagery, and it affords very broad discretionary power to our e-safety commissioner. So it contains rapid website blocking provisions that to prevent the circulation of abhorrent um, violent material. Um, it also reduces the time frame for takedown notices from 48 to 24 hours. Uh, it can require search engines um, to delete links or app stores to prevent downloads. And, and it attracts civil penalties of up to $111,000 for non-compliance. And I think there's a few different issues with um, the Online Safety Act. The first is this new online content scheme where basically users can complain about any sexual content that they find online that is not subject to a restricted access scheme. So that can include actual sex, simulated sex, implied sexual activity, as well as explicit nudity. And we know that sex workers already experience very malicious flagging um, as well as restrictive terms of service. Um, and the e-safety commissioner can basically decide whether or not they take it down if they think fit. So they're not required to give any reasons. There's no criteria for what warrants removal. And it's kind of like a, a return to having a chief censor rather than a classification board. 
The second issue is the, is the affordance of really unchecked power to the commissioner to make these decisions without adequate oversight. So they can conduct in investigations, they can order removal notices as they see fit. Um, there's no requirement to give reasons or also no process for users to be notified or have an opportunity to respond to complaints and no requirement to publish publish uh, transparent enforcement data that would allow civil society or researchers to kind of hold, uh, analyze it and hold the commission into account. The third issue is the power to create an age verification system um, without sufficient consultation with affected communities. And this is something Australia has been thinking about for ages. We've been looking to the UK in this respect, but the UK actually dropped its plans in 2019 because um, of implementation difficulties as well as privacy concerns. Um, and a, an age verification system could involve the uploading of identity documents, scanning of fingerprints, um, undergoing facial recognition technology, or even having your age estimated by artificial intelligence based on your behavioural signals. So we could end up with basically a database of people's sexual preferences, our browsing histories that could then be leaked, hacked, sold, misused, or even used, um, shared with law enforcement. And then the fourth problem is um, there's basically an incentive for platforms to simply remove and deplatform all sexual content in order to comply with the standards, which makes it a little bit um, like Foster in the US uh, in the sense that platforms, they might employ AI to, to screen and detect nudity at scale, which again risks overcapture, or they might just think, well, that's too expensive, that's too onerous, so we'll just take the simpler route of just banning sexual content altogether. And it's important to note that um, our Broadcasting Services Act already prohibited the hosting of X-rated content on Australian services. Um, so this uh, new act reduces the timeline, but it also applies to websites that any Australian user can access regardless of whether it's hosted. And I guess the larger problem is that it just reproduces a classification framework that is already problematic and then just simply like exports it into an online environment. And it, it just contributes to this, this ongoing problem of increasingly secret, uh, arbitrary and unaccountable decisions about the kinds of sex and sexualities that are visible in online space. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> anyone who's been following uh, along on the on the um, Online Safety Act knows that Digital Rights Watch has plenty, have taken plenty of issues with it. And I think you summed it up really beautifully just then, as, as beautifully as you can for such a flawed piece of legislation. Um, but moving on to more positive notes. Very grateful for all of your advocacy during that time. <laughs> it was a, it was the time. It was, it was a time. <laughs> so on a positive note though, you've been working on a manifesto for sex positive social media that organizations, collectives and individuals will be able to sign that sets out fundamental elements for what platforms and governments need to do to build safer sexual spaces online, which sounds rad. Um, can you tell us a bit more about that and, and what you think needs to happen to have sex positive social media? Yeah, for sure. So this was a session that we held at RightsCon in June and RightsCon is a global summit on human rights in the digital age. Um, we held a session on alternative frameworks for sexual content moderation and we facilitated a discussion with um, a range of other sex workers and sexuality scholars, um, including Gisley, uh, Emily Coombs, uh, Emily van der Nagel, Katrine Tiedenberg and Maria Miller-Young. We were the facilitators together and we're currently in the process now of drafting a manifesto for sex positive media. So we're hoping that individuals or collectives or organisations will like to sign on or contribute. So this is a plug to say, please get in touch if you're keen to be involved. Um, and it takes a holistic approach to spelling out some of the basics. So the regulation of sex is political. Platform regulation obviously shapes our Im imagination and our sexual possibilities. But also sexual content is cultural and social and it should be integrated with other media. And then it sets out how sex positive social media requires shifts in the structures and the businesses and the revenue models of platforms who need to start actually valuing sexual content creators in material ways instead of just um, exploiting them or treating them as disposable. And that kind of restructuring of platforms shouldn't just rely on 
consultation or tokenism or market research among sexually marginalized communities. It's about pro promoting and prioritizing sexually marginalized communities as stakeholders, as decision makers, and as leaders in the actual governance model. And creative, creating sex positive social media also means that platforms should be transparent about the decisions that guide their design instead of just pretending that they're neutral. So instead of targeting sex, they ought to be aiming to address sexism and racism and transphobia and whorephobia, ableism, or all the other manifestations of social oppression uh, and structural oppression on their platform. And uh, one important thing is to remember that legality and illegality are not determinative of whether sexual content is consensual or ethical, because many forms of, of consensual sexual activity are unlawful in various parts of the world. And social media companies often look to restrictive and repressive regulatory regimes as their baseline standard for governing sexual content. But actually, we advocate that platforms have an opportunity to improve now on the poor sexual ethics of governments. Um, at present, uh, platforms spend a lot of resources uh, attempting to address non-consensual intimate imagery, but a lot of the resources that are spent on detection and screening and carceral approaches could be redirected and reinvested into community to prevention and support efforts, including sex education, uh, relationship and consent education. And if platforms are actually genuinely concerned with consent, sexual content creators ought to be able to place limits on boundaries on how their content is actually shared. So instead of just having a privacy policy that's like a tick box or, you know, one click tick or to the terms of service, actually provide pathways so users can give informed and specific and dynamic consent to say, yes, my content can be shared with researchers, but not with advertisers or not with startups or not with law enforcement, because sex positive social media also means resisting surveillance capitalism. And I think actually there's a strong case uh, to argue that platforms should be creating mechanisms to detect undercover police and to prevent the entrapment of their users. And then finally, sex positive social media requires an enabling legal environment. So we need governments to decriminalize consensual sexual activity and repeal laws that hinder access to sex education, harm reduction, and also to regulate to prevent the formation of media monopolies and to materially support the proliferation of independent media and alternative economies. Amazing. It sounds like the kind of manifesto that I absolutely want to sign. Um, so when it's ready, where will people be able to find it? Um, we're going through a consultation phase yet. That is yet to be determined. But please um, reach out to me on social media or um, my QUT email address and I can keep you updated if you are interested in um, being involved, especially if you are part of an organisation or a collective who is a stakeholder in, in sex, sex positive social media. Amazing. It sounds so good. And honestly, it fits right in with, with, I think, the really what we're trying to achieve with this project as well in terms of that idea of how can we rebalance the power between digital platforms and those who populate them with all the content that makes them great. So I think that it, it's um, that's such a nice way to end this, this little segment of tonight's event. Thank you so much for sharing your experience and your insight with us. Um, we are now going to swap to the panel with the panelists. Thanks again, Zara, for coming though. Um, and we will, sh well, I'm sure that Digital Rights Watch will probably share that, that manifesto when it comes around too, because it sounds, sounds excellent. Thanks so much for having me. Okay, so we are now going to kick off the next section of tonight's event. So we're going to start the panel discussion with our um, excellent panellists. So I'll give you a little overview. I'm not going to read out their entire bios because they are amazing and daunting and will all die of imposter syndrome and just never come out of the hole. So I'm just going to do the, the, the sort of highlights reel and you can head to the Digital Rights Watch website and read their full bios um, and just kind of bask in how amazing these speakers are. So um, we have, I think, I think they'll join the, the, the stage at at some point soon. So Eliza is a disabled hacker, freedom of information enthusiast, sex worker, and co-founder of Assembly4, 
Assembly 4 is a collective of sex workers and technologists who create sex worker friendly products and services. Hi, Eliza, thanks for joining us. Um, we also have April. So April is a writer, public speaker and model. You might better know her as the Bodzilla on Instagram. She has quite a big community following on Instagram there. Um, and if you don't already follow her, you, you definitely should. Um, hi, April, thanks for joining us. And we have Joshua. Joshua is a queer philosopher, writer, and poet, and their research interests broadly include issues of authority, justice, and power. Joshua also recently wrote a piece on the Online Safety Act, which we were just talking about, which we'll dig into a little bit. But thank you, Joshua, for joining us as well. Okay, so there's loads to get through, so let's just jump right in. Um, first of all, I want to sort of start. I'm going to start on some positive notes because there's lots of there's lots of issues to unpick, but I want to start in a good place. Um, so let's start with you, April. So you've been building this online identity, the Bodzilla, for quite a while now, um, and you've been cent centering messages of self love and body acceptance, fat positivity, and anti-racism and really it seems like you've created more than an identity you've created a community on Instagram so I would love to hear a bit more about creating that community that identity and um, and a bit about how perhaps the internet has enabled you to do this more than maybe you would have been able to without it I don't know let us know yeah hi thanks uh, for having me Sam uh, first of all I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of land from where I am broadcasting, the Gunungara people. Uh, and I think that is one of the, the better questions that I've, you know, been asked in relation to who is the Bodzilla. I guess people really want to know um, how do we create these communities for ourselves? How do we engage with people who feel and think the way that we do and who want to uplift us, who want to be part of a change? And I think that's something that the internet, specifically social media, does allow us to do, although in the context of this conversation, we know that we're, lim we're limited, we're censored, um, you know, we're discouraged. And so starting off, it was more just wanting to focus on something that I was already passionately sharing about, kind of on what was just a personal Instagram account. And then through a number of different cool opportunities that I had, I started to build up a bit of a, like you said, a little bit of a, a, a following, a community. Um, I don't like to kind of think of that as a following in the sense that I am just as much kind of going, I don't know what I'm doing as much as anyone else. Um, but I certainly think that as someone who's always been quite loud and proud, as they say, about the kind of person that I am and who has done a lot of work to accept myself and to feel confident about who I am and what I look like, I guess that if I was to say that this community was anything to me, I would just like to think of it as a big group of people who are all cheering each other on. And I think that in the past, we wouldn't have been able to connect with each other the way that we do. I mean, I, I grew up in a small town um, and I don't feel like going out onto the street and screaming, I love myself just the way I am. It would have worked quite as well. Um, so I think the ability to connect with people who you would never normally be able to talk to is one of the most important parts about online community and social media. But the fact that you can only say what what the um, the overlords will allow at times is also one of the most frustrating aspects. Being able to connect with your community only to have that ripped away uh, by having your account threatened to be closed down, by having your posts removed, and not being able to leave comments and interact with people because you're going against community guidelines, uh, what community? <laughs> um, probably not the queer community, not the fat community, uh, not the community of people of colour, black people, indigenous people. Pretty sure none of those community guidelines uh, would state that we need to all be censored and stopped from talking about the realities of how society needs some serious work. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we'll dig into that a little bit more. Um, one of the other things that I wanted to raise, though, is that you, so you've been pushing for um, more representation of fat black bodies in the media in particular, and you were the first um, truly plus size model to, to wear a bikini on a billboard in Australia, which is amazing. Do you, like, what kind of role do you think that the internet and your your platform played in being able to, you know, have for that moment to happen? Um, yeah, I mean, amazing. I still think about that and go, 
really happen, you know, and especially because did any of this really happen the last sort of 18 months? Um, but the, I think my ability to connect with the brand and the people who were behind the billboard um, was definitely based on the fact that I had uh, some reach uh, with my social media platform and that I was able to, you know, they're, they're a Queensland-based swimwear company. I haven't been to Queensland for I don't know how many years and I normally shop my swimsuits online. So the fact that they were able to say, hey, we want to send you a cosy and then say, actually, we really love that you love wearing it and being confident and we saw that on social media. So let's take it to the next level, I think, is just um, is, is pretty amazing. And I think I've said this more than once, but I think it can't be said enough that me being the first person on a billboard in a swimsuit in Australia with a body like mine, with skin like mine, wow, the bar is pretty well just, you know, on not on the ground necessarily, but it's low because I am someone who benefits from light skin privilege. I am still able to shop in some stores easily. I don't experience the same colorism. Uh, I don't experience the same anti-fat bias as people who who identify as super fats or infinity fats. Like I don't, I don't think that me being on a billboard was the um, the ultimate life changing act. However, it was a good start, and I think it was a great place to jump off from. I think when we see bodies, um, you know, whether that's you know, we've got to think about the idea that um, I wasn't representing disabled bodies, I wasn't representing trans bodies, so you know it's one it's one time a billboard got it right but we've got so many other ways and marginalized identities that need to be represented and normalized um which I, you know i don't i don't love the term because what is normal you know i think we're all normal because we just are existing but i think when you read the responses that i got and i will say i did get a time, probably the only time i've experienced any kind of like trolling or negative comments on um any of my posts was when this when this went live and I you know was uh in a couple of media publications and I was receiving just lots of really random mid like middle of the night waking up to um like pig emojis and vomit emojis and I was like do you really think that hurts my feelings do you, <laughs> have I never said anything meaner to myself than an emoji please but the you know for every one of those silly comments that I got I had people DMing me um, some sending me beautiful messages, like video messages, um, just showing them so emotional, just expressing how that made them feel and how they felt accepted. Everybody deserves to feel like that. And so I think that people who don't look like me and who don't, you know, exp haven't got the same experience as me but live in oppressed communities and are part of, um, you know, or identify in various different intersections, they need to be represented and they need to feel those positive emotions around seeing themselves represented. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you're right, we do have a very, very long way to go, but I think it is a really, uh, really nice example of how the, the change that can happen by, you know, growing these movements online and then people start to recognize and be like, oh, actually, people do care about that. Or depressingly, that'll sell, which is bleak, won't go there too much, but you know, and then it translates, and translates into more mainstream spaces, which is you know debatable whether or not we always want that. But anyway, I think it's a good positive step, and I think it's a really great, really great example. Um, turning to you, Joshua, on the back of 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 that, I think there is this sense that uh, online spaces do create ways for people to meet one another or to be exposed to to people, especially marginalized groups, especially those in the LGBTQ plus community. I know I certainly relied on that as a teenager growing up. If I didn't have the internet in a small country town, it would have been a much sadder time. Um, but I'd love to hear from you about, you know, a bit about the ways that digital platforms and online spaces are really sort of, I guess, essential to the, the queer community. Yeah, um, that's a great question. Uh, first of all, I would like to recognize them streaming from the sovereign lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation here in Nam and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Um, to answer your question, um, I think that uh, when we're talking about platform moderation, um, there is the kind of immediate uh, individual harm. Um, so if someone gets shadow banned, if their account gets deleted, um, then, you know, that's a harm up for the individual. But I actually think that there's something much more 
uh, pernicious going on at the community level. You know, one of the things that makes uh, queers as a people distinct from other minoritized communities is that we don't generally, uh, this is an asterisk, some people luckily do, but we don't generally grow up in queer families and we don't, uh, we're not born directly into queer communities. Those are structures that we need to make or, or, or find often at uh, a lot of great effort. Um, uh, and, and so uh, this idea of moderation, uh, which I'm using very broadly to encompass also just uh, straight up censorship, um, has the pernicious effect of uh, suppressing uh, people's ability to, to find, to access and to create community. Just lost my mouse there. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's spot on. And I think that, I mean, I'd love to hear your opinion. I think that beyond community as well, though, there's um, potentially, you know, the ability to access education or to the access health health information, for example. I mean, what do you think about, about that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, all of us walk around every day with the <laughs> repository of human knowledge uh, in our pockets. Um, and so the ability to um, access information which empowers you in your everyday life is extremely important. You know, that kind of goes to conversations um, that uh, are being had around the, the idea that um, access to the internet is a human right or should be considered alongside other basic utilities like water and electricity. Um, I, you know, and I think uh, probably more into the kind of remit of the digital rights watch, it also has an almost political communicate uh, implications in terms of people's ability to uh, communicate uh, political information to each other and organize uh, against uh, oppressive structures, not just online ones, but ones in meat space also. Uh, so in order to uh, mount political opposition um, on a number of different fronts. Um, so, uh, you know, TLDR, uh, <laughs> uh, online content moderation, not always great. <laughs> I mean, I guess we can just, we can all go home. That's, you summed it up. <laughs> I mean, we are home. What am I saying? We all, we're all home already. <laughs> um, uh, so moving to you, Eliza. Um, so, We've heard a little bit from, from Zhao already. He sort of set the scene a bit some, with some of these sort of overarching issues um, when it comes to content moderation and censorship of sex workers online. So there's clearly lots of challenges. But again, I'd love to hear some of the positives to, to begin with. Um, so, you know, can you tell us a little bit about the, the positives of the internet for the sex worker community and the role that the internet and digital platforms can play for those in the adult industry? Um, yeah, it definitely can. I quickly just want to acknowledge that I'm also on the Wurundjeri land. Sorry, I can't say that very well, of the Kulin Nation. Um, and it's amazing that how many of us are sitting here. Um, and I'm really proud of the uh, people who are emerging as elders, um, as well as the past. So uh, in terms of the good, platforms, regardless of your occupation, as we've kind of discussed, uh, discussed, gives you access to a community. And especially with the very much ongoing pandemic, having an uh, online community is just so much more important than it used to be, especially for sex workers. Online platforms can help facilitate a lot of things, um, better working conditions for some, um, knowledge and skill sharing um, amongst peers, and the sheer joy and creativity that is sex worker led art initiative and conferences. But I think for me, um, the one that really sticks out at the moment um, is connecting people to organize. In the last 20 or so months with the pandemic, sec the sex worker community has been hit so significantly harder than some of the other communities. Um, there has been little to no government support for the sex worker community, especially in um, locations which are heavily criminalized. And what the community did was to just mutual aid. Um, the amount of different events that were run, the amount of uh, sex worker organizations that were reaching out to platforms um, like Assembly4 um, and doing those kind of things, it made a huge difference. It was life-saving. Um, and that was, that was actual real good for me. Um, 
we saw a real um, tangible benefit from that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's depressing that those are the circumstances that um, the sex worker community find themselves in and, you know, and, and people more broadly as well who also lost income, but as you said, the sex worker community were hit particularly hard, but I guess it is super uplifting to see the community come together like that and for people to support each other. Um, I don't believe that they should have to, but um, it's beautiful to see that. On that note, let's switch to let's let's switch gears a little bit and talk about some of the challenges, some of the bad things, the things that aren't working well. Um, and then we'll make way for as we round up tonight, we'll talk about uh, ideas for making it better. So I'll make sure that we leave people on a positive note at the end. But before we get there, the bad things. So let's stay with you, Eliza, for the moment. Um, so. Through your work with Assembly 4, you've created sex work friendly social, a sex work friendly social space called Switter. That was yep. a tongue twister for me. <laughs> um, and an advertising pl platform called Trist. So you have a very particular set of experience in this space when it comes to building platforms, um, which you know is centered around the very content that that these other major digital platforms are. You know, really struggling with. Um, so I'd love for you to tell us a little bit more about Assembly 4 and some of the problems that you're seeking to tackle um, with the various products that, that you've created. So Assembly 4 was founded in 2017 and like every other startup we were going to create a CRM <laughs> um, but we were noticing ourselves and amongst the community that sex workers were being pushed off um, platforms at considerably higher rates than usual because as Zara said it's very important to realize the sex workers have been kicked off platforms for a very long time um, I think there's articles going back from 15 years ago where PayPal was still doing it then um, so we started Twitter which was is a social network which is founded on um Mastodon which is an open source software um, which runs essentially like Twitter if you've never used it um, so that provides very much a community link, um, especially when platforms are going quite hard and kicking people off or shadow banning people. Um, and we wanted to keep Twitter free because we don't think those type of resources should cost people. Um, so we started an escorting directory to just support it. Um, so with Trist, we wanted to also move the dial. A lot of escorting directories use straight up slurs to describe their workers. Um, and we're trying to also uh, push the client base to not be looking for those kind of things, um, taking power away from those words that are oppressive and awful. Um, currently, our biggest focus is working with uh, sex worker-led organizations and initiatives uh, targeting criminalization of sex work. So we are pro-decriminalization of sex work. Um, sex work is work and we deserve the same protections as every other industry. So yeah, that's kind of what um, we're doing. I imagine it's uh, never a dull day at the <laughs> at Assembly 4. Um, no, no, it is not. Uh, we, it seems like every other day there's a new piece of legislation that doesn't make sense um, um, and it just keeps on coming. Yeah, relentless. Um, so for those who don't necessarily understand the industry, what do you think are like some of the key or, or most important um, things for people to understand about how sex workers are forced to navigate the more mainstream digital platforms? Sex workers, uh, people of colour, queer people, fat people, disabled people, we get forced into creating like a, essentially another code of how we describe our products. Um, you might have heard people, uh, you know, on Instagram uh, calling it lonely fans and those kind of things to avoid getting picked up. But, of course, as the terminology gets used more and more on the platform, uh, content moderators pick it up and add it to um, certain uh, automated pieces of software. Um, so there is always the constant fear that what you're doing is going to get you kicked off. And with Instagram, one of the really interesting things is it's no longer about what you do on the platform. It's the platform you also link to that can get you removed. Um, so linking to a fan site is enough to do that. 
Yeah, it's definitely, I, uh, it's interesting following people and sort of seeing the vocabulary kind of evolve and seeing seeing the way that you can, you can tell that people are uh, trying to stay one step ahead of the content moderation, but then it, it just has to keep changing because obviously they and then And that makes it really hard to find community because if yeah. you don't know the latest lingo to avoid censorship, then you lose your profile with all of the people you know um, all of your clients, it's, it has real life implications for people. And I do not think platforms care. Um, there is too much of a risk mitigation um, point of view mm. being taken. Yeah. And I think that that brings us back nicely to um, the Online Safety Act, because one of the concerns that Digital Rights Watch had, and one of the concerns that, that Zara raised earlier was that when that it would essentially incentivize digital platforms to take a blanket approach to censorship and just be like, it's too hard. Every, it's it's too hard. Get rid of it all. Um, so that was a that was a huge issue that that was brought up, and I, I think it will be interesting to see how that how that plays out. Um, but moving to you, Joshua, back to the Online Safety Act. You you wrote about about it before it passed, um, with specific reference to the LGBTQIA plus community. Do you want to share with us some of the, you know, the the highlights reel of that and, and your thinking around the Online Safety Act and um, and the queer community? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, it's a difficult act to follow Zara, um, who pretty comprehensively... Um, Thankfully, uh, you are going to summarise it. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, so we're talking about uh, this bill that has a lot of moving parts, one of them being this um, age restriction scheme um, so that in effect, anyone would be able to report anything that's not behind some kind of age verification login screen of some kind. Um, and uh, then the um, this government official then having the power to decide whether or not to take that down. And the one of the main problems with it is that uh, it's so broad, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, obviously um, affects sex workers and their work, um, obvious, uh, obviously has implications for pornography, um, but it could be something as simple as a nude um, taken and sent consensually between two adults or, 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 or posted onto Twitter, um, which has emerged as, um, you know, the kind of uh, circa 2001 Tumblr of uh, amateur pornography and uh, kind of um, sexually liberated communities. Um, uh, the, the, the other thing that I think is um, particularly uh, <laughs> egregious about the Online Safety Act now, uh, now that it's passed, um, is that it ultimately relies, as Zara suggested, on much older kind of uh, classification schemes. So um, in particular, the National Classifications Code, um, which deals with things like you know, morality and obscenity and, and what a reasonable person might take objection to and it's really interesting um you know away from the kind of um the media of what the government was saying it would do um the communications minister paul fletcher singled out sex acts like fisting or or piss play um as things that were abhorrent and would have to be taken down if reported and you know you don't really need to read very far in between the lines to uh, see what community <laughs> he is uh, primarily thinking of there um, uh, so, uh, you know, there are really uh, obvious uh, ways um, that the law would affect uh, queer people and their expressions in particular. Um, and, you know, it really comes out of a particular way of drafting law in really um, non-specific and broad ways and saying, uh, what we want this to do is the only thing that it will do, rather than looking at how the law is actually worded and what it will allow government officials to do in practice. Yeah, yeah, I I hear you, and I it's I like I'm kind of loath to call it the Online Safety Act. Like it feels I call it the Online Safety Bill for so long, and now it's like ugh. Oh, it's <laughs> yeah, I mean it's it's a huge misnomer. I think that. <laughs> Um, you know, the the concept of content moderation raises the question of what is being moderated and for whom. Um, and, 
you know, on the one hand, there is this need for moderation, um, as you kind of foregrounded talking about how, you know, this event itself is moderated. So when we're talking about individual and community safety, so things like hate speech, uh, child sexual abuse material, animal abuse, self-harm, um, as with Christchurch, the live streaming of terrorist act, there is a need for moderation in online spaces. It shouldn't be exactly like the Wild West. There are rules that govern conduct and, and the display of things in, in public and you know, to an extent that should be the way uh, online as well. However, <laughs> uh, there is another sense in which moderation is simply the enforcement of conservative moral norms that are framed uh, as decency, morality or anti-obscenity laws. And they really come down on non-normative people. So people who aren't straight, aren't white, aren't skinny, uh, able-bodied and, and have uh, perfect mental health, uh, so on and so forth. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think you hit the nail on the head there. Yeah, this. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, while I've got you, though, I want to follow you up, follow up with something else that I've been thinking about in this space is how um, and coming, I guess, coming back to this idea of like individual community harms and then sort of broader harms. I'm curious about your opinion on sort of like the flow on effects of heavy handed content moderation and how the sanitization of online spaces can impact things like art or expression, culture, and then how that also translates into the real world as well. Um, for example, you know, there was a heated, or there is every year, a heated debate about no kink at Pride, and there's always over-policing of queer communities and, and how those sort of things kind of all create this hotbed of awfulness. Yeah, that's a that's a big question. Um, so I mean, I think there's a couple of things that go into that. Firstly, when we're talking about online spaces, um, you know, there's a big uh, oh, I'm I'm having a mental like um, like a a, a false uh, distinction, a, a double standard is the word I'm looking for um, between uh, what is and isn't moderated. So thinking about sexual content, for example, um, you know, a gender diverse person posting empowering images of themselves, um, uh, you know, that makes them feel good about themselves um, is deemed inappropriate and as against community guidelines. Um, but, um, you know, a platform uh, selling commodities using sex in some way, whether it's a scantily clad woman or a kind of suggestive image in some way is Fine, uh, which really just uh, underlines um, that you know content moderation often represents uh, um, a regime of you know capitalist heterosexual patriarchal enforcement, which attempts to erase or at the very least sanitize minoritized people. So it's a kind of systematized rejection of queer identities and experiences, uh, a digital banishment from the online imaginary, uh, and, you know, by extension, bringing that into the everyday, uh, everyday life. Um, so that obviously has a detrimental impact on individuals who lose content or lose, uh, you know, income or job opportunities, um, but who are also coerced into uh, self-censoring, um, you know, uh, So just, just to kind of summarize all that, I think that attempts to, um, uh, you know, moderate queer art expression and culture are often little more than uh, kind of eliminations, a, a kind of sinister dequeering of queerness, um, uh, which is a, a roundabout way of saying it's a kind of forced assimilation into majoritarian norms and culture. And so, it, you know, translating that into the real world examples, or, or as I like to call it, the meat space examples um, that you brought up of kink at pride, um, or say the over policing of queer communities, the policing of, of queer bodies and queer identities and expression sits side by side with state violence. Uh, in the form of, of traditional policing. So I won't go into too much detail because it's a, a whole kettle of fish on its own, but you know, business and uh, the kind of limited liability corporations in particular are really just extensions of the state, which fulfill functions that the state doesn't want to administer or wants plausible den deniability for. So for example, the suppression of uh, certain minoritized peoples. Um, and, you know, those uh, processes go hand in hand, as I said, with uh, censorship um, and those older models of classification. Um, so in the same way that kind of, um, you know, uh, 
queer expression and, and nudes and art will be, um, uh, it, I think, in all likelihood, uh, attacked by the Online Safety Act. Um, you know, the Online Safety Act in its core relies on the National Classification Code, um, which already produces simply the, the, the dodgiest decisions. So to use a really concrete example uh, uh, with the film, uh, Tom of Flin Finland 2017, which is a biopic about the uh, famous gay artist, uh, Tom of Finland, um, that uh, a copped an R18 rating um, by the National Classif Classifications Board in Australia. Um, and uh, cinemas that wanted to show it for queer film festivals had to get special dispensation in order to do that. Um, but that film is rated as PG, um, or, or uh, suitable for uh, teenagers in 13 countries. Um, and when you look at uh, <laughs> the countries with the most conservative takes, you know, every time it's the UK and the US and Australia and, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, alongside uh, some of the other jurisdictions that we would uh, stereotypically consider as uh, the most uh, homophobic. And just kind of on that point, you know, it's important to consider that platforms trend towards this most conservative interpretation of community standards or similar um, in order to operate over many jurisdictions. But what that involves is essentially bowing to uh, homophobic, transphobic and queerphobic norms and laws in order to make money. Um, so you have these kind of globally operating uh, uh, tech companies who are cooperating with uh, violence, uh, violently homophobic governments to oppress and suppress gender and sexual minorities. And you know what that does in the domestic case in a more general way is sanitize uh, you know those minoritized people, uh, you know sexual culture more generally for public consumption by you know, a suburban family audience. And I say that in order to link that back to what you said about kink at Pride, because it's much the same thing, you know, Pride is a protest. It's not meant to be consumable for straight people. It's not meant to be consumable for middle class people or for families. You know, if if you're uh, offended by people dressed up in kink at, at Pride, then fucking good. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's much the same process of trying to integrate a, 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 a a particular group into the framework of respectable middle class white uh, colonial society. And, you know, the kind of sad thing is that uh, many uh, in uh, the uh, gay community, <clears throat> white gays, uh, are all too willing to, to do that. Yeah, yeah, I just noted down a sinister dequeering of queerness, which just like, oh, hit me, because um, I, <laughs> I think it's so spot on. Like, it's it's this kind of, in, this, like, oh, my goodness, I'm overwhelmed by everything you just said. I'm trying to, like, piece my words together. This, like, default sort of sexualization of identities that are not the dominant status quo, and so, of course, they get sucked up into content moderation, but you also don't necessarily want to be the status quo because what does that look like? Um, yeah, you know, it, it, you know, it's a double standard again. So um, not to be very crude about it, but, you know, if straight people announce that they've been having a lot of condomless sex, for example, in order to conceive a child, that's perfectly fine. We celebrate that. That's a, that's a congratulations, good for you situation. But if, you know, a gay person wants to be like, hell yeah, I've been having lots of condomless sex. It's been great. Suddenly that needs to be sealed up. That needs to, that needs to be not on a, a, on a platform. Um, and, you know, the other half of, of, of what you were just saying was, you know, um, we don't necessarily need to change ourselves in order to fit that conventional normative model mm -hmm. because often it's, you know, not, healthy and you know I don't want to go into the whole you know anti-marriage anti-monogamy thing um but I'm not really interested in fitting into whatever Instagram thinks the idea of community standards are um because we have our own norms and we have our own culture um and we have our own practices and I think that that is what I really value oh I love that yeah definitely oh thank you <laughs> So April, we have you back. You dropped out for a second there, I think, to put headphones on. Um, hi. Hello. <laughs> um, so you have a bit of first-hand experience being subject to content moderation online. Uh, I would, if you're happy to share with us, we'd, I'd love to hear a little bit about the, that experience. Yeah, sure. Um, I actually dropped away because my sound was not great. So hopefully it's better now. now. Yes, perfect. Good. 
Woo! Okay, well, it's important that everyone hears my voice, although I could probably turn the mic off. I'm very loud. Um, and yes, the answer to that is yes, I'm happy to share. So uh, after there was a campaign that started online and it drew attention to the fact that certain types of bodies were getting censored. And then I posted something that without thinking fits straight into that same category of the type of images that were getting censored. I was topless. I wasn't, it was only like, you know, waist up, whatever. It was a very fun photo. It was me holding a foil balloon. The caption was, you know, nothing to do with anything particularly salacious. And I received a notification probably 15 minutes after it was posted to say that it had been removed for uh, solicitation. Uh, which I really didn't feel like that's what I was doing. And because like, I'm pretty sure the caption was completely unrelated to anything um, even mildly interesting. I'm pretty sure I was just talking about how cute I am. <clears throat> anyway, um, so I had received that notification and became mildly irate, you can imagine. And this happened uh, in October last year. So I, I feel like things have changed a little bit uh, and I know that that's something that you know from our conversations prior to this this evening that it's something that we know is changing but then Joshua everything that you have just said um, and yes I wrote down the word sinister queering of queerness because I just was like oh whoo, I wasn't ready to hear such a powerful sentence wow um, I yeah I just think that we're seeing where we're seeing a shift one way we're seeing other things shifting so it's not it's not necessarily an actual change. It's just where we're looking um, and what's being focused on. And we know that that's something that, uh, as I as I call them before, the overlords use. Look over there, you know that that distraction. Is it you know it's Julia Stiles's boobs. It's it's whatever it is. Um, but her boobs would be acceptable um, because of course, yeah. So um, as long as you couldn't see the nipples, though. So. The little like love heart emojis over the top. Just li- yeah, exactly. <laughs> love it. Um, so I, I guess what you sort of were alluding to, I, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, was was um, last year when uh, in the UK there was a, there was a whole uproar about this when uh, Instagram removed images of a black model. Her name's Naomi. Nicholas Williams, I believe, um, yep. and that kind of kicked up a bunch of momentum over there. And then, following, like on the back of that momentum, here in Australia, Celeste Little posted. You know how people will probably may be familiar with Celeste, not oh, it's not Celeste, Celeste Little, Celeste 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 or Celeste, Celeste as she shall <laughs> now be known, Celeste. Um, um, yes. Yeah, she posted a, an image like recreating this um, uh, an image of a thin white woman who was Care to you know, pole. Yeah, and so Celeste's image got taken down, um, and that really highlighted the the kind of double standard around um, thinness, like thin yeah. bodies and black bodies online. Yeah. So you were a little bit, in, uh, as far I as far as I know, you were a bit involved. You know, Naomi, do you want to? Um, Look, like like I said, online community means people who think yeah. and are like you. So Naomi and I uh, are, yes, friends, Instagram friends. I suppose we haven't met in real life. That whole being in a totally different country, COVID really put the kibosh on that. But, uh, yes, and I think actually it's interesting that you mentioned Celeste Barber because I think that that's almost drawing attention to an issue within an issue because Naomi had started a campaign. She had had a photograph taken by Alex Cameron, who's a well-known photographer from Cambridge. And Alex had shared photos more risque, shall we say, uh, in the past of her own body. She is a slim femme person, a uh, white person, and had never had any issues. Now, Naomi was dressed uh, in, I will, I would say, like bike shorts, like that was the kind of, you know, tight short and was holding her her breasts very like these were the most beautiful images shot in front of a vintage sheet with beautiful little flowers on it such a you know a classy not that not that we're you know um really wanting to lean into that kind of stupid standard but that that idea that it was something that was quite beautiful frameable um in no way offensive I think you know And so Naomi had posted then the same image onto her Instagram that Alex had posted, which was one of the more risque ones from the shoot. 
and it got taken down. And Naomi had been worried that this was going to happen um, and as she reported in a story that she did with The Guardian, that was something that she actually expected to happen because this wasn't the first time. However, because uh, then Gina Martin, who is an activist who was instrumental in outlawing upskirting in the UK, uh, got involved, shared the message. They wrote an open letter to Instagram. It was signed by uh, Stephanie Yeboa, Jamila Jamil, a number of other people. And so the the head of Instagram, Adam Mosseri, got in contact with Naomi. And what happened from there was discussions around changes to the way that those, uh, well, the algorithm wasn't changing, but the guidelines were changing. So that what was deemed unacceptable was what was referred to as breast squeezing. So, you know, it can't be too sexy. Um, but in the case of as you say, a thin white woman doing the same pose, no issues detected. Um, what I found interesting about um, you mentioning Celeste Barber there, the fact that her having the issue that she had was she replicated a photo where the person, I'm sure it was Candace, um, had she sort of placed her hand over her breast but because of her breast size. It didn't appear to be breast squeezing. However, because Celeste has big knockers, for want of a better term, um, she had to like grip to stop it from falling out and being like, oh, hi, everyone. However, and you know, I, I think that that's, that proved a point that Celeste having the imperfect body got taken down. But the fact that the Australian media only paid attention to this campaign when Celeste Barber drew attention to it, and once again, the voice of a fairly slim white woman overshadowed a campaign that had been started by a fat black woman was it you know a thing within itself that we definitely saw then um some acknowledgement from different publications saying oh this in fact started with Naomi but I think the issue that you have to have the certain level of platform you have to have the certain amount of reach you have to be palatable to the right media publication for your issue to be relevant you have to you know, uh, Joshua, what you said before about the consumption of events that are not designed for the, the communities that are wanting to gaze on them. I think the idea that this campaign was started by Naomi, Gina, Alex, for fat black women to get exposure on the platform. So when a slim white woman complains that she's been victimised by the algorithm and by the system, by the bots, um, and her issue gets publicised over the top, that just demonstrates the same issue over again, that we're willing to listen to the palatable, to the white, um, you know, and, and I think that that's why I find, uh, I guess, a, a level of power in being able to say hi okay so you're listening to me I've been deemed at an acceptable level of brownness an acceptable level of fatness to be you know the voice of a certain group of people I'm not I'm just like look at me now look over there listen to what I'm saying now listen to what I'm amplifying and I'm, I'm gonna mute myself oh because nobody wants to hear me cough that was but, perfectly fine. <laughs> thank you. I've been practicing. I do a lot of Zoom meetings. So I, um, yeah, I just think that the issue that Naomi experienced and the fact that even this year I received a notification from Instagram that one of my stories from last year had been removed. Guess what it was? There was a picture of Naomi, one of her posts that I'd shared to my feed. They're still doing it. It hasn't, it hasn't changed. And again, by doing this, making this change, announcing these changes to their guidelines, it's also allowing them to, you know, within the following week, they were talking about how they were going to start cracking down on sex workers on their platform. So that was like within seven days, it was like, oh, okay, so we're going to help those people out, but now we're going to stitch these people up. It's not, yeah. it's not different. It's, it's the same. It's, there's a finite amount of squeeze on marginalised communities and it's simply if they alleviate the pressure somewhere, they've got to put the pressure on somewhere else because they can never allow more of us to have a voice and that's the, that's the real problem and I think talking about the ways that different organisations and different, um, you know, uh, systems of censorship and the moralizing of how we're expected to view things I think if we if we think that we've come a long way because chubby people are allowed to be seen not fat people chubby people and we think that that's a step and we don't take any time to reflect on the fact that how far we've come is about like this far 
then we have a real problem. And I think that that's why conversations like this are so important because what is allowing such a, you know, a varied the different varied perspectives but also giving us an opportunity to learn from each other and I think that um the idea that you know I could join this conversation and not go away feeling like I have so much to think about uh, you know as someone who who proudly tries to amplify marginalized voices and and to do that I still am like I have no idea what I'm talking about <laughs> I, I I need to, to spend so much more time you know uh, Zara's opening conversation everything that Joshua and Eliza have have said I just am so grateful that we have this platform and I would love for it to be a mainstream platform rather than us having to come to a separate space to have this conversation I think that the days when we see this on a even if it's late night <laughs> television uh you know I think that would be that would yeah. be that would be this far like I mean this far? I would certainly tune in for sure maybe, <laughs> maybe that's what would like prompt me to get um actual tv and not just stream things but anyway, I digress. Um, we have about 10 minutes left. So I want to just, we'll, the last few questions I have are centering on like next steps, things that we'd like to see changed, ideas, they could be big, they could be small. Um, I also want to let the audience know that we've got a poll running at the moment. If you want to jump into the poll down, down there somewhere and um, vote away, go for that. Um, so <laughs> Eliza, I'd love to hear, I think, just to wrap this up, some, some lessons that you've learned from Assembly 4. Um, do you practice content moderation? Do you have the secret, the secret sauce? <laughs> there is no secret sauce for content moderation. I, I hate to tell you this. Um, I actually yeah. am probably, uh, I'm not of necessarily the belief that automated systems should be allowed to run riot by themselves. Um, it is how uh, marginalised communities are being taken down. You actually need humans to be a part of this um, conversation and uh, work. Um, so for me, um, I think the most important takeaway when it has come from Assembly 4 is the people who are moderating your platforms should be a part of those communities. Um, those communities have context and cultural awareness that you're never going to get out of a piece of code that was written by a white dude who got hired based on his dad. Um, we need to do better um, and that is the entire tech community. Um, and I don't think until the tech community is willing to accept we are not apolitical and our platforms and the products we are creating aren't, um, then we're just gonna keep hitting the same problem over and over again. Absolutely. I hate hearing people talk about tech being apolitical or being neutral hate it I, I, yeah. yeah and i think it is so important that we choose that side we choose marginalized communities we choose to support them and give them platforms we can't keep giving platforms to people who have all the privilege we deserve a voice oh you're gonna make me cry okay um Joshua, do you have, you know, any, what, what would you like to see from digital platforms so they could better serve you and they could better serve the queer community? Acknowledging that you're not a voice for all queer people, I am aware. <laughs> I don't, I'm not putting yeah, it I, I was about to um, add, a, add that proviso. Um, mm -hmm. I guess uh, my first thought is just uh, critically to question whether or not uh, there is necessarily a solution. Uh, is it possible that simply these platforms created by companies that want to mine our data for a profit um, that, that, you know, want to fit perfectly into the cis-hetero capitalist patriarchy are for us? Maybe they're not for us. And maybe it's more important to try to imagine new spaces that uh, are, are, are our own in some way. That being said, that's a bit utopian and a, and a bit wishy-washy. So in terms of the hard concrete things that we could see, firstly, clear, well-defined protocols, rules, none of this community guidelines rubbish, like want to know exactly what does and doesn't uh, pass that threshold. Um, secondly, a broadening of those rules. You know, you can, you can post, uh, you know, you could post a Greek statue, the whole purpose of which it was created is to 
arouse and titillate. Um, but if you want to do the same with your own body, you are not allowed to do that. And that is just very silly. Um, other things would be like, uh, you know, uh, opt in rather than opt out filters. So I don't know if people know this, but Instagram in Australia brought in an opt out filter just this week that will censor any kind of post that it flags as inappropriate in some way. It hasn't told users that it's doing this. It's just done it in the background and buried it in the settings. And so if you aren't, uh, you know, uh, friends with people, people like Zara and Eliza, you might not even have known that this happened. Um, so that's, a, that's another one. I also think that local rather than global rules. Um, so having uh, content moderations for at the very least national communities rather than this kind of lowest common denominator global setting, um, which is obviously just hyper conservative to a hilarious degree. Um, then there are, you know, there, there are other things that go into how that goes about, you know, uh, I do a lot of work in public health, especially community led public health. So absolutely needs to be community led. If you want to moderate a community, then community should decide what those rules are. Um, uh, as uh, Eliza said, um, absolutely there cannot be AI. But the proviso that I would add to that is that it also can't be just outsourced to exploited workers in exploited economies working for 13 cents you know, an hour. Um, so it needs to be well paid and, and well supported humans who are helping us create these online spaces. And that goes back to the whole uh, corporations shtick um, that I was yelling about earlier. Um, ultimately, I'm not really holding my breath because what's driving this culture of moralism and censorship is, you know, on the one hand, uh, the profit motive, uh, on the other hand, a uh, hostile legislative environment internationally that are that's been created by you know, neoliberal and conservative governments in Australia and the United Kingdom and the United States of America especially. Um, so you know, each of these issues and each of these jurisdictions is kind of a pitched battle, but nothing is going to change ultimately without wider consciousness raising and social change. Yeah, absolutely. And I think like that community-led part is so important. And so I'm going to come to April right at the end, but before I do, Eliza, you've got a multi-stakeholder group happening. Do you want to do do a very quick little yes. about so, this? Sounds cool. Um, there is a bunch of sex worker-led organisations, adult industry, human rights organisations and other people who are just scattered around the community who are interested in trying to build a framework and, uh, I guess, open source guide for communities to run their own um, platforms because I do think Josh is right. We need to be building our own platforms because that's how we really do get, I guess, some freedom. Um, but I also want to just quickly state that we, yeah, we can say that we should be building our own platforms, but there is a lot of liability and cost to those people and those communities who do do that. Um, yeah. I mean, you would, you would definitely have first-hand experience of dealing with that. <laughs> And finally, April, if you could speak directly into the ear of these digital platforms and ask them to make some changes, what would you ask for? I mean, I'd start with stop it. <laughs> Just stop it. Um, but <laughs> I think I want to know if you can flag every post that mentions COVID and if you can hide the hashtags that allow people to avoid being exposed to harmful conversations, use that power for fucking good, please. It's not hard. It's clearly not hard. I think, you know, we've got people in the tech industry who are telling us how easy it is if you are just willing. And I think with great power comes great responsibility. And so I think the responsibility is on them to listen to people and ask for the opinions and the advice of people who live in these communities who are being oppressed by these algorithms and this moralizing content censorship. Strong message coming from all of you that we need us to be community led, which is um, music to my ears because that's exactly what we're doing. So on that note, thank you so much, all of you, all three of you and Zara earlier for joining us. It has been an excellent conversation. I hope that um, you've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed it and I hope our audience has enjoyed it as well. Please, if this has sparked ideas for you at all, we want to hear from you. Um, so, you know, get in contact with us. 
you can tweet at us, uh, but also fill out that survey. It'll really help us to understand some of these broader community perspectives so that when we are coming up with um, policy recommendations and future campaigns, we really want a digital rights to ground that in the community needs, um, concerns and perspectives. So please fill out that survey and share it around. Um, but thank you again, everyone, uh, for coming. The audience, you're wonderful. Speakers, wonderful. That's all from us. Thank you for having us. Thank, thank you. you so much. This has been such an amazing experience to just be in the same room. As <laughs> room. Yes. One day, one I day. I look forward to the real thing sometime. <laughs> yes.